Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Just uh, going to wait for uh, waiting room to clear before we start. I'm still watching the numbers tick up slowly, so we'll uh, we'll wait a few more seconds. Okay, I think I'm going to start there. There's a few people still uh, still joining, but uh, we've got a lot to get through today, so um, I'm going to uh, start the presentation now. So um, welcome uh, to this launch event for the Energy System Digital Twin Projects Augmented Visual Demonstrator. My name is Ellery Thatcher from Energy Systems Catapult, and we have been working with Fraser Nash Consultancy and Cityscape Digital on evolving and improving our Energy System Digital Twin Demonstrator. Next slide, please, Heather. So I'd like to start by addressing the purpose of the Digital Twin Demonstrator. So to decarbonise the energy system by the year 2050, it is crucial that decision makers are equipped with the insights that they need to ensure their decisions are effective and influential. With increasing assets under the control and monitoring of digital systems, digital twin solutions are being realised as solutions able to digest, model and represent the increased valuable data streams being created. So this digital twin demonstrator investigates the use case of decarbonizing homes by attempting to understand uncertainty and presenting results in an easy to understand and visually appealing way. Next slide, please. So uh, for the session today, I'm first going to introduce you to the panel. I'll then set the scene and my colleagues from Fraser Nash Consultancy and Cityscape Digital will present their work on the demonstrator. We'll then move on to the panel discussion, which is your opportunity to ask questions via the Zoom question and answers function. And you'll also be able to take part in an interactive poll at the end of the presentation. So we won't be using the chat function for questions today, but feel free to put comments or observations in there if you'd like to. So let me introduce you to our panel uh, facilitating the discussion is Henry Fenby Taylor. Give us a wave, Henry. Uh, he's the Chief Executive Officer of Athene Ophelia Limited, and as the former Head of Information Management for the Centre for Digital Built Britain, he is an advocate of digital twins across industries. From Fraser Nash Consultancy, Andy Marr, who leads their strategic modelling team. From Cityscape Digital, Ruman Dimov, who leads their digital transformation team. And from Energy Systems Catapult, my colleague Richard Dobson, who leads the digital capability. Next slide, please, Tabitha. So, yeah, what do we mean by digital twin? So, there are a number of definitions and varying opinions, but for clarity, this is how Energy Systems Catapult views the answer to this question. A digital twin is a system which is able to incorporate a two-way flow of information between a digital model and a physical object or system, where making a change to one can affect the other. The flow doesn't necessarily have to be in real time. What is more important is right time. So what we've developed so far for this project is a digital shadow. It takes data regarding the physical asset, and in this situation, that's building energy usage data in the national buildings model and field feeds that data into the digital representation of the UK's energy system from where we can change technology levers to predict a journey towards net zero. Next slide please. To support the transition to net zero the digital twin aims to support the use case of domestic decarbonisation. So often information is siloed between different organisations and people based on what those people are currently working on. Generating a full picture of what is happening within a wider system is difficult, and chances are effort is being duplicated and message messages are being misunderstood. So the original brief from Bayes was to find a solution to this problem, aligning models and information sources in a way that provided outputs 
giving holistic insight for all manner of users, whether they be non-technical or technical. And as this use case focused on uh, domestic decarbonisation, decarbon decarbonization. Um, we also uh, have the ability to move through geospatially and temporarily to explore the effect of policy measures throughout the UK. And a point to note is that cost was consciously removed from the twin and the focus is on the potential of various technologies to deliver net zero. Um, so I believe the next slide, Tabitha, is video one. Um, if you could play that, please, and I will be talking over it. Um, before we review the improvements, let's take a look at the demonstrator generated in the previous project. So the user can choose from a number of policy levers to generate the prediction of when net zero will be achieved. You can see that in the top left hand corner by choosing low, medium or high for each of the three policy investment types. The slider at the bottom of the screen can be moved to show the progression through time from now to net zero. And by clicking on the Technologies tab at the top, the user can see more numeric data. Again, this data changes as you move the slider through time. By enlarging and zooming in on the map, you can see the data for specific regions. And you can see more data for specific technologies or more general metrics by clicking on the buttons on the left hand side. There is a regional view for even more granular data. And we focused here on Manchester. And there is a local view, which shows how a typical street will change over time as new technologies are adopted. Notice the solar panels on the roofs, the external insulation on the walls, heat pumps appearing outside, and EV chargers in the driveways appearing as you move through time. The data for each specific house type appears when you click on it. And you can zoom and plan around to view the house, the houses and the streets from different directions. Using the technology tabs on the left hand side, you can focus in on specific technologies. And again, you can see the data specific for each house type by clicking on it. So uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to Andy from Frozen Ash um, to talk about the changes that we've made uh, and the improvements that we've made to that demonstrator. Thank you very much, Eloise. So hi, everybody. I'm Andy from Frozen Ash Consultancy. So I'm going to talk about how we arrived at the goals for this stage, version two of the project. Uh, looking at some common challenges that you see in digital twins today. So this is a typical setup for a digital twin on one hand, on one side of it, you have reality, it's the real world, and maybe some data feeds from the real world into your digital twin, which chooses to expose some of that real data or reality to a user on one side. They've got to use the twin to make um, either some decisions. So they've got to maybe understand the real world better, design something, manage um, achieving an outcome uh, in the system of interest for them or make some predictions with it. So they're going to make some choices, make some decisions, and then feeding back the other way through the digital twin, try and achieve the outcomes that they want to do. And I think on each stage of this diagram, there's certain challenges that we wanted to try and look at in this stage of the project. On one side, on reality, it's, you know, it, sometimes it can be oversimplified, uh, we think, in digital twin setups. So the real world's really messy. It's complex, it's turbulent, it's uncertain. There's lots and lots of missing data that you don't have, that you wish you had feeding into your digital twin. The digital twin can sometimes be, um, be argued to be a little bit opaque, maybe. So they don't necessarily expose all of that real world to the policymakers or users on the other side. Um, looking at the policymakers or users themselves, they've got lots of stakeholders to try and convince whatever decision they want to make is the best one. 
how do they do that best? They may have a counterfactual and a policy option that they're looking at that they want to try and compare. So how do they compare different op options for them? And then how do they actually understand how confident they can be in their decisions? How much trust can you put in to the data feeding through the digital twin and the decisions they're going to make? And then again, going back through that arrow to the outcomes they want to try and achieve, can they really visualize using just some numbers on a screen or some, some uh, you know, perhaps some, some simple uh, visualizations that you might normally see in a digital twin, what that's going to look like in real life? So next slide, please, Tabitha. So we took some of those challenges as inspiration for our goals for this stage of the project. And we have four main goals, and they're deliberately not in order, by the way, before uh, someone maybe picks that up. So on the left-hand side of the diagram, we're looking at this missing data, perhaps uncertainty in the real world and how that's, um, that's exposed to the user of the digital twin. And can we try and demonstrate the confidence that someone can have in the answer and maybe use some of that uncertainty to our advantage? Right on the other side of it, once that data is fed through, uh, perhaps through a digital twin model, can the policy users really easily compare different options available to them? Um, and can they do that effectively and convince, convince the stakeholder community that they've got to talk to, that they've come up with the best decision? Number three, going back through the digital twin again, can they use the information they've got available and the model itself to try and understand the logic of those outcomes that the digital twin is telling them is going to happen. And then finally, can we do something more to maybe visualize the reality of that policy outcome for the users? Uh, so next slide, please, Tabitha. So how are we going to do that? Um, this diagram is representing what you just saw in that video a few moments ago from Eloise. So this is the version one that was carried out last year. And what you had is a national buildings model, which fed some data into um, what we called the middleware. So that was a static data set output uh, from the national buildings model, which was then visualized in the demonstrator project. Um, and if you could change the slide again, please, Tabitha. And so what we try to do in this project is do some more exposure of, of what we think that that uncertainty is in the real world um, and we've replaced the middleware here and part of the model with a probabilistic graphical model so it's graphical because it's just made up of lots of different nodes connected um, by edges to different components of the model uh, and it's probabilistic because each one of those nodes contains uncertainty uncertainty due to lack of information missing data um, general real world complexity and messiness, which we can encode in the model. Um, and we can use this to calculate not only what we think the best guess is at the answer, but also how confident we are in that answer as well. Uh, I think it's probably about time to go from here to we actually show you what we've done. Um, so I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague Ruman at Cityscape Digital. He's going to talk you through um, the new version two digital, um, digital twin demonstrator. Thank, thank you. Thanks very much, Andy, and very good afternoon, everyone. Um, Tabitha, can we please play video two? Um, so, as mentioned by Andy, um, we have ourselves we have set ourselves for specific goals for the development of this next phase um, of visual demonstrator. So, what does it look like? As before, we have the ability to look at the data in a dashboard format, giving the user the three key levers to pull with regards to investment in the broad policy areas. Uh, unlike version one, however, we now have the ability to compare the different policy scenarios with different levels of investment in those specific areas. Um, this principle has driven the evolution of visualizations design, uh, allowing us to compare the carbon emissions and their reductions against a specific point in time by 2050, as well as the makeup of the contributions born from these three areas of investment. Um, the inclusion of the probabilistic Bayesian network approach now gives us the ability to include confidence as another dimension to visualizing the data. Um, and this gives us the ability to express things like the median probability um, around hitting the target date net zero. Uh, having the ability to compare the policies is further enhanced by adding something that would be very familiar to the target users, uh, curtain view functionality, uh, allowing an um, immediate and intuitive understanding of the multiple sets of outputs being represented. 
Um, another addition is the ability to filter, uh, split the results against the median values of certainty and policy impact um, in order to surface where the impact is high and we have the best degree of certainty or rather returns of the illustrated intensity of investment. Um, to add further insight into the ability to compare the impact of the illustrated scenarios, we now included a progress chart which allows us to map the quantum of carbon reductions across all of the local authority areas. This now gives us the ability to illustrate the individual impacts in the various areas against their own individual targets, as well as the degree of confidence maps, you know, against the X and Y axes, respectively. And of course, we can still switch between our selected policy scenarios to see how they compare um, against those metrics. As you can see here. Another new addition to our arsenal is the outcome logic map, which illustrates the distribution of contribution what a mouthful, um, <laughs> to the overall carbon emissions calculated for each policy scenario. What this is, is effectively a summarized representation of the Bayesian network calculation uh, inputs and calculation steps, which we feel is integral to the user's ability to understand and trace back the logic of the outcomes in order to make sense of the results. As with all the other dimensions uh, in the digital twin demonstrator, this is connected to the timeline slider, and as a result, we're able to visualize how contribution changes over time, which you can see as the changing thicknesses on uh, the various paths and connections on the screen. And as a result, we can surface what is the critical path that influences the outputs of the policy selections which we've made, which, as always, we can easily compare. Um, moving on to Another uh, big upgrade that we've made to the model, uh, what we've done is a uh, complete rework of the local view. Putting ourselves in the shoes of the target user, uh, for example, a policymaker, the main aim here is to communicate the practical reality of the proposed policy impact in the individual areas, which presents us with multiple challenges that have driven the change here. On the one hand, there is a drive for realism in order to answer questions like, okay, the data makes sense, but what does it mean on the ground? What does it look like on my street? On the other hand, a previous approach, which was a more stylized geospecific illustration, potentially opens up conversations that the user may not want to get involved in. For instance, the model might tell us that by 2040, 60% of the houses in the area need to be insulated, but which 60%? Why is my neighbor's house uh, getting insulated and not mine, or you know, vice versa? Um, there's also the realm of GDPR with regards to individually identifiable information, and there's, of course, the ever-present issue with scalability. Um, so what we've done here is take a step back and completely change direction. Instead of representing reality, if you will, um, what if we instead imagine the target residential areas as categorized in a set of non geo specific character areas and use that to visualize the point instead? The policymaker can then make a judgment as to which scenario best represents the character of the specific area. For the purposes of the demonstrator, we have only represented two scenarios of the areas that we imagine would be high on the list of targets of all the types of retrofit improvements imagined, um, an urban warehouse conversion setting and sort of a mid-century suburban setting. Of course, there will be many, many more that will be relevant here, but um, that as a challenge is, in fact, far more manageable from a scalability perspective and completely does away with some of the potential difficult situations that we might be otherwise, uh, we might be getting ourselves in otherwise. And finally, as always, we retain the ability to compare the impact of our two policy scenarios and track this all the time. So, um, yeah, hopefully this gives you a good feel for the direction we've taken with the demonstrator. Back to you, Eloise. Thanks very much, Ruman. Um, so, uh, Tabitha, yeah, perfect. That's the summary slide. So, thank you to Andy and Ruman for taking us through the changes to the Energy System Digital Twin Visual Demonstrator. So where does this fit in with policymakers? So you've seen we've improved the data set using a Bayesian network to generate uncertainty data, which has new visualizations to go along with it. We've added an option to compare two different policy choices. The user can now view and trace back through the logic to understand their output. And we've updated the local view visualization to make the impact of policy changes more realistic. So in summary, digital twins have the potential to help policymakers make confident decisions in a complex and uncertain scenario by quantifying that uncertainty, visualizing multiple options and allowing them to trace back the output, the input data. So to talk more about why we've approached the problem like this, what we've learned and what's next, I'm going to hand over to Henry for the next part of the event, which is the panel discussion. Thank you so um, much. Sorry, uh, Henry, uh, Tabitha, I don't think we need the slides at the moment. 
Wonderful, wonderful. We've got a number of questions uh, that have come through in the chat. Please keep adding there. I did, however, have some prepared because, of course, of course we did. Um, so it's very interesting uh, to me seeing this presentation, looking at this big, large scale piece of work become increasingly granular. Um, and that relates to one of the questions. But it does look like there's a lot of uh, detail here that's emerging around this uh, around this uh, this work as so we're seeing it develop. Uh, where is this where is this going to go next? I guess is the, is the big question that um, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Richard. I think Richard. Hey, nice. Uh, thank you very much. So. Um... I guess there's, there's lots of answers to that question, but firstly, I guess the Energy Systems Catapult, we're a not-for-profit. We're here to stimulate innovation, unlock opportunities for uh, UK innovators to help develop solutions to the net zero challenge. So really our role in the sector is about trying to create the right um, environment for innovation to thrive. Uh, and part of what Part of that is making sure that innovators are supported and part of that is making sure that the, the people who are developing policies and new markets have the right information at their fingertips to make the right decisions. So I think from our perspective, this is a, this is a really valuable tool for us to be able to help engage engagement with government, help innovators get across the, the, um, the potential value of their new products and services they're developing and be able to really um, engage politicians, civil servants who aren't necessarily technical experts in every single thing that they're going to talk about, but they're able to um, get a real world feel of, of what these interventions might mean for, for people on the ground. So from our perspective, this is a really good communication tool. This is a really good um, asset for us to be able to use in communicating innovator needs. But what's next for this tool? Well, I think we, we definitely see some value in continuing to develop the, the Bayesian network approach, uh, particularly interesting given that the sheer number of uh, uncertainties we have around decarbonisation. I think that's a really interesting uh, novel way of thinking about this, and we'd like to continue to push that further. And We've seen huge strides forwards within this project around the, the, the visual aspects of the demonstrator and how engaging they are, particularly the, the 3D um, local view is a huge amount more engaging uh, than the first iteration. And I guess we'd like to see the continuation of being able to develop better and more, more meaningful interactive visualizations for our user base. Um, and I guess this is all focused around ESC helping the innovative community around energy, energy systems and decarbonisation to build and develop better products and services that help get us to net zero more quickly. Great. Thanks, Richard. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting hearing about how this kind of fits together with the policy and it also fits together with the uh, the innovation uh, ecosystem. Um, I just wondered, uh, Eloise, if you wouldn't mind uh, drilling into that a little bit more for us, this sort of, uh, you mentioned at the start that uh, cost wasn't being included, but we've heard from Richard about uh, the kind of the interactions between innovators and, and government. Can you just expand on that for us a little bit? Yeah, so uh, the reason that we didn't include cost was a specific customer requirement. And the, the, the reasoning behind that is that the transition to net zero is going to be very expensive. And if you if you if you put a whole load of pound signs on a on a on a demonstration tool like this or, or any kind of tool, um, it can immediately turn people off. You know, they see millions of pounds and they think, well, that's that's never going to happen. So we decided to focus on um the 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 uh the other the other impact that it would have uh on 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 people um and uh and the visualization of the local level is 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 is, is the, the strong point there in that you can look at it and you can imagine your street and you can imagine what would it look like if everybody gets solar panels on their roofs and and I quite like my Victorian terraced house what well, it's not going to look quite the same with external wall insulation on it is it and have those kind of discussions because ultimately the transition to net zero 
is not just in the hands of the policymakers. We've got to bring um, everybody along with us. And answering those sticky questions about where's my heat pump going to go is actually really important to, to stimulate that, that discussion. Yeah, I, that, that really that really comes across to me. And I, I can see just from my observations how we've almost started at this kind of quite um, broad brush uh, approach. And this relates... Um, Apologies to those asking the questions and bringing some of them together. Um, it does uh, clearly there is uh, there is some modelling here as well as data um, that's being brought together for these different uh, purposes. So I'm going to uh, ask uh, the team, uh, starting with you, Andy. Um, what have you learned about um, about this this world uh, going through this process? Oh yeah, in interesting question, Henry. Thanks. Um, the, I say with any model building process, you learn obviously a huge amount about the thing that you're trying to model. And um, although I think a lot of people on the call probably recognize a lot of information and detail around net zero already, um, you know, I've done projects on this in the past. It's not my area of uh, specialist expertise in particular compared to data science and modeling. Um, so I was really interested in how the outcome showed some some aspects of the transition which which i didn't quite appreciate beforehand um such as the confidence um aspects and the uncertainty in achieving net zero in fact so we looked at a whole range of different policy options here you can see there's you know different combinations of different levers that you can pull to generate different policy um option scenarios and actually the vast majority of those did not achieve net zero which should have been obvious i think in hindsight uh, but before i did it but actually it helped me to appreciate a bit more how difficult it's going to be to achieve to achieve net zero by 2050. And then you start to see things in the uncertainty distributions outside of you know, the, the best median estimate of when we're going to achieve net zero. So you get ones that even though you might achieve net zero under really you know, strong policy of by like, say 2040 or something, there's a huge tail of uncertainty which even we, we think according to these calculations, we're not going with the, there's still a good 25% chance that we won't achieve net zero by 2070. And you can start to trade off then these kinds of questions of would you rather have policy options that, um, you know, best guess achieves it by 2040, but has a really long uncertain tail, or would you rather achieve it maybe 2045 with more confidence that you're going to definitely achieve it by 2055? And that's the kind of trade-off you can start to play around with, with these options. That was, yeah, an interesting insight to me that I didn't appreciate beforehand. Um, that, along with some, some of the distributional effects around the UK that you start to see when comparing the maps side by side. So it's something, again, policymakers have got to deal with all the time, uh, basically levelling up. You know, how, how do you decide what investments to make around different areas of the country? And you can start to see uh, both in the bubble chart that Ruben showed, in the, the map when you're comparing two different policy options side by side, actually there's a big difference in the pathway that some parts of the country have to go on to achieve net zero. And that can open up a debate around, you know, do you put different amounts of investment in different areas that have a stronger, uh, stronger transition, stronger amount of progress to make? Um, you know, how equitable do we want this transition to be? And, yeah, having, having the ability to compare different uh, different things around the distributional effects, I think it's going to be really key to making sure that um, we not only get to net zero as fast as we can, but it, it's done um, in the best way possible, you know, whether that's um, equal or equitable around the country, and you can start to have those debates now. Right. Yeah, I think that's that's it, isn't it? Being able to have that debate, being able to manage with data is really what digital twins are all about. And if that's managing the country's um, policy, it, then that that is a useful tool. It would be wonderful for uh, governments of the future to be able to simulate very clearly, as this is kind of directing us, simulate their 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 policy options and have a degree of certainty of of, of how that's going to work. So, um, talking of certainty, and we've we talked around these the basic model, etc. Ruman, coming over to you. Um, in, in terms of the uh, the data and the data sources that have been used here, there's a number of uh, questions being asked in the chat about um, where is the data from? Is it just a simulation? How much can we rely on it, et cetera? So I wonder if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about what's going on under the hood. 
Yeah, I think this might be one that actually Andy will be better equipped to answer. Um, oh, my as bad. As I, <laughs> no, it's fine. But as far as I'm aware, uh, it's it's mostly coming from from the same data sources that we used before. It's just the method of interpreting them has um, has shifted from giving us kind of empirical black and white answers to you know actually getting a little bit under the hood and understanding you know what, what sort of degree of confidence do we have in in you know the, the metrics that are coming across. And yeah, trying to communicate this has been actually a fascinating, um, fascinating design journey. Really interesting. So, uh, what, what have you learned from the from the process, and what's been your, your kind of big takeaways, and your your how has your uh, your view of this space changed? Well, one one of the fascinating takeaways from from my perspective was, I mean, this this is kind of I'm, I'm a little bit biased in that regard, I guess, because my my area of interest is mostly around engaging communication on, on topics that appear very technical on the surface, but need to be communicated to the wider public. I think I always touched on this really well a minute ago that um, it's one thing to know the right answer, but it's an entirely different challenge to actually get everyone along on the journey. So, I mean, the, the notion of digital twins generally, when, when you say this to someone, even in people in the know, um, tends to be associated with um, a realistic, real representation of reality in a digital space. So kind of the, the design decision that we took kind of halfway through developing this, we were going back and forth and in loops around it. And we were like, there's got to be a better way of doing this because you know, due to the nature of what it is, actually representing reality is not necessarily the best thing, but it still needs to be, uh, there still needs to be a, a means of communicating what this might actually mean uh, so that you can cut past this sort of initial almost allergic reaction that, that people might get to, you know, um, in, it's an emotional attachment to their space and, and, and their community and what sort of impact this might have on it. But you still need to have the debate. You still need to be able to sit around the table and be, it might look something like this, uh, but sort of having this, um, you know, component of an imagined space that conveys realism is, has been something that I, I thought was quite different in, in the way this is approached. And, uh, I think there's there's some merit in exploring that further. Yeah, definitely. So that kind of leads on to um, uh, on to my next question, really, which is, you know, so this is this has done uh, the work that it was set out to do, and it's clearly indicated that there's a number of different options that that uh, the government and individuals and society can take to um, to push towards uh, net zero. Um, what next so what so what can we do with this what 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 we what is the what's the big next step that needs to happen to 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 make this work and to become you know a vehicle for change and that is open to to our floor so whoever unmutes first is the one that gets to talk on the subject and if nobody yeah richard you get you get it you win i was about to press unmute and then you said whoever unmutes first and then i, then I got nervous <laughs> took me a second um so um i think the, the interesting thing is that uh, like Ruman was saying that we often think of digital twins as quite a technical um technical feedback loop um but actually with net zero we've got this this huge unknown um, of you know the the general public in the loop in the control system, um, and I think that's a, a lot of what holds us back is in terms of decarbonisation isn't necessarily technology. It's the political will, the uh, the the worry that politicians have around the acceptability of certain interventions, and actually having tools that are able to both provide policy makers and, and decision makers within the energy sector uh, of really clear visualizations and really clear articulations about what the pros and cons of their decisions might be to, to them so that they, they can become comfortable with the decisions and then be able to use that literally the same tool, being able to use that as uh, a communication method for the general public is really important. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm particularly interested in with with this tool is we've had we've had an awful lot of announcements of policies around decarbonisation and uh, subsidies for homeowners to install energy efficiency or heat pumps or various things and the problem is that we we make the big announcement but actually it's very easy to say it's failing pull the plug too quickly and what we don't know is 
actually, what did we expect to happen? In what time frames? And is this all going to plan? The Green Homes Grant could have been an incredible um, step forward in terms of energy efficiency. But obviously, it was felt that it was failing. But what we don't know is, was it failing? Or was that just how long it would take the supply chain to scale up during the tail end of a pandemic? Um, and actually, if they had a modeling tool that allowed them to do take real world data, do some simulations, understand what to expect, and then continue to feed that model with real world data as the policy rolls on, we would have a much better idea about should we be keeping our foot in here? Should we keep um, going down this route or is it time to pivot? Pivoting's great, but you can't pivot too many times otherwise you end up doing a U-turn. Uh, and uh, I'm just going around in circles. So um, yeah, I, I think from my perspective, it's really good for communication. Uh, it's really good to give policymakers and decision makers the confidence in the, the decisions they make and also tracking the, the expected versus reality. Uh, and I think that's so important. Definitely, and 10 out of 10 for your visual metaphor there. Um, beautiful work for me. I love to talk metaphor. <laughs> absolutely uh i think it's uh, i think it might have had enough now but uh no i loved it well we've had a, a a number of questions come in in fact the top three are on a very uh similar vein um now i'm bearing in mind and i think our listeners should bear in mind as well that this tool exists for a purpose which is to inform policy decisions and to kind of create this you know this interchange between what happens uh, and uh, what is planned versus what happens versus what to do next, you know, that sort of kind of relationship. Um, but the questions that we have at the top are, are, what are the underlying computational models? What assumptions have been made in the design of these models? And how is their design and performance assured? Um, I'm going to read all three out because I think they're related. Uh, two is, what is the granularity of the digital twin in terms of time and load resolution? Um, do, you, does, do things like uh, EV charging, uh, usage, and et cetera, does that come down to the individual home and the individual uh, electric vehicle? Um, and then finally, to kind of really put a cap on it, is this linked to real uh, data? Um, is it good enough for that purpose? And I think that's really my summation of this is, is the data good enough? Are the models good enough for the purpose that have been set out? Um I'll start with answering that question, if you don't mind, and then I'll hand over to Andy. Um, so um, to be clear, this is a demonstrator. Um, it does use real data from the National uh, Buildings Model, um, which lists out uh, energy usage per uh, archetype of house. Um, it is a static data set. Um, and what we have done is uh, um, create a dynamic data set based off that uh, original re real data if you like uh, for the purposes of demonstrating what a digital tip twin could look like so although we've tried our best to make the answers that the demonstrator is giving uh, be realistic um uh, they they are not real um there is no validation uh, or assurance um it is the aim of this demonstrator is to exactly that demonstrate that if we did do a digital twin of the entire UK's energy system looking at the use case of, of a domestic decarbonisation it could look like this but that would involve a lot a lot more work um, however the work that Andy's team have done on the uh, Bayesian network um, I'll hand over to him uh, to explain exactly what the assumptions were uh, in building up that network. Yeah, it's a good, great point, Eloise. Yeah, to totally agree. It's it's a demonstrator project, isn't it? Um, but, you know, the hope is for us that we've done this, we've showcased some of this work, and we would love to see some other people get inspiration from these ideas and to use those in the next stages of development for their digital twins. We think, you know, that, that to me, that's that's the whole purpose of doing this project, is trying to inspire other people, to see what other things could be done uh, with some perhaps alternative approaches. Um, but yeah, just just picking off some of some of those questions around the granularity, um, uh, another another bits around it. Um, yeah, so what we did with the Bayesian network approach is we we started off by building the model in a, we tried to make it scalable. So we did it on a per household basis. So the network calculates calculates probability distributions um, per house that, that allows you to then scale to a street level, to an area level by tweaking the input distributions to be appropriate for that area around the country. 
and you can even run it on a national level um, with, without without difficulty. You just have to change what what scale of input data you assume. Um, so so yeah, that that allows us to you know look at different components and to uh, to run it locally uh, for things like the the views, the three D views that that Ruman showed us, um, or to run it nationally to see the whole picture. Uh, you know, sum up everything in between. Uh, right. You can keep going if you like. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep going. I was just re reading through the other parts of that question. Uh, so yes, it does go down to individual homes. Um, the EV side, uh, we we looked at the context for what we wanted to try and do with this work. Uh, and yeah, we, we had to choose a boundary somewhere. So we chose home decarbonisation as the boundary, uh, where in, in this, we didn't have to do this. So we, I think it would have worked just as well if we included EVs or didn't include EVs. But we decided not to include EVs in as for the scope of this model, we thought that was part of transport. So if you're going to try and decarbonize transport, you might include EVs there. I mean, it's just an arbitrary decision though. You could easily have included EVs in here. I think the outcome would be uh, just as useful, perhaps, perhaps more useful. But it, yeah, as Eloise said, it's a demonstrator project. So we had to draw the, the boundary somewhere. Um, I, think, I think Andy doesn't want anyone to keep going. I can see you like, let's bring the EV in. Let's <laughs> I, was, go. I was going through the next one and just working out, yeah. <laughs> Where's How are you going to address that one? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, where did you go down to, Henry? In your list, is this? A, uh, I was the, the, the top, the top three by most upvotes. So it ends with, "Is this digital twin linked to real domestic properties, i.e., the real world?" And I feel like Eloise did did answer that quite well. Um, so I'm going to move on, if that's okay, uh, onto two related questions. Um, one is, will you be making this open source? And two is, can we play with this? Which is a somewhat related uh, queries. So um, I'll take the open source and there's an open data question in there as well. I think I spied somewhere. So I will, Go for it. I will link the two as my uh, pet um, topics. Uh, so, we have been pushing for the energy sector to consider more the wider use of open source technologies uh, for quite a while. We've been supporting the Open Digital Solutions Competition that's Innovate UK funded. Uh, that's all about open source development. Uh, we are working on the Digital Spine Scoping Study with uh, the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero, um, which again is all based around um, the concept of open source foundations for the energy sector. Um, many of the underlying um, tools that we've used here are actually based on open source technologies. So uh, there is already uh, an open source kind of heritage at the heart of this project. This is a demonstrator. So whether or not we consider fully open sourcing this project as a sustaining um, thing going forward, I guess is still something that we have to discuss in terms of a, a project team. Um, we definitely want to share the learnings where there are things that are valuable for innovate, other innovators to pick up. So where we feel like the catapult has done its bit uh, and it's for someone else to run with it, then we will you know, be looking to publish the insights and publish as much as the, the technical content as possible. Um, but whether or not we're entirely there to be able to just publish this um, more widely is it, still an open question. Um, in terms of being able to give people access that's really about scalability so we do have the ability to kind of allow people to get access to it we probably can't just publish it openly to the world because we will end up uh, with a system that just keeps falling over uh, this is a demonstrator ultimately um, so it's not meant to, to scale massively um, but yeah I think one of the questions that came up earlier that I'm, I'm just going to sneak back to is the availability of data. Um, we know that that is a real challenge in the energy sector. We've been working on that issue tirelessly for the last four or five years now. Um, actually, when you look at this, there are a lot of data sets that are available now. There's a lot of real world instrumented um, smart equipment deployed across the energy sector we could absolutely be hoovering up more of that data. Um, we're at the Catapult, we're the data processor for some of the uh, electrification of heat data. So all the monitoring data that comes off heat pumps that are deployed as part of that program. Huge amount of information there. 
the question for us came around uh, personally identifiable information uh, and our ability to use that data within this project. We felt we didn't need to have real people's data integrated at that, that level of granularity um, to, to demonstrate what we were trying to demonstrate. Um, but absolutely going forward, you would be looking to integrate real world data uh, and that would require either open licenses or um, a common way of sharing data. So I think both of them would be really important. Great. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's tricky, isn't it? Uh, when you open source something, it needs a community uh, for people to uh, take it forwards. And I can understand what you know. You want to you want to get things to that point where there is somebody to hand it over rather than just tossing things over the fence, which is not what we want either. Um, we do have a a poll ready to ask your good selves uh, what you think uh, are important in terms of digital twins in the future. Um, that poll is appearing now, um, and I'll ask you uh, all to uh, answer that. And uh, this this questionnaire was developed by the Energy Systems Catapult and the team. Um, so, in terms of the purposes of what we've been doing here, you know, looking at the energy policy specifically around uh, homes um, and uh, creating something that is useful in terms of setting a direction. Um, looking at the sort of questions that we've had, creating trust around, you know, what, you know, people asking the, the difficult questions, as you should, about what's the data, what's the sources, what, where does this all come from, what's the, what's the provenance, and, and can we trust it? You know, these, these are the sort of important questions that, you know, if you were to make this live, um, and the government were to make big decisions on it, then it would be a big issue. Um, while you're still going, I'm going to read out some of the uh comments that have come in as well. So um, I think uh, there are a number of very interesting ones. Uh, thank you to uh, Emily Ainsworth. Uh, just uh, Emily just wants to say that this looks fantastic and it's uh, amazing to see the uh, work that's been done. Oh, that's there. really nice, Henry. Emily worked on the previous projects with us. Um, so that's really nice that she's joined today. Hi, Emily. Uh, and uh, there's a number of uh, other things uh, on uh, some interesting links if you look in the Q&A um, there's a YouTube link to uh, on how you, uh, open source can propagate naturally thank you for sharing that Robbie Morrison much appreciated um, it's uh, really interesting to see kind of where the priorities are in terms of making this decision I, I thought it was really interesting um, uh, Nigel Nigel Morris um, saying to Richard uh, uh there seemed to be an expectation that we would have done these sorts of models before announcing things like the green home scheme um but what the digital twins model will do is expose people's assumptions in in, in building building them as well that's really interesting i think um right i haven't answered the question yet so i better do that and then uh, then i will move on um okay how are we doing mm -hmm. which oh no no i haven't i haven't picked one yet um, there we go. There we go. I've submitted mine. Thank you so much for all of that. Aha. Uh -huh. And we have the outputs. There we go. And that that speaks uh, volumes, really. I think answering the right question, uh, obviously, I ignored the number one. Um, I just would invite some reflections from the team uh, on these answers and creating trust in the output seems like, you know, yeah, absolutely such a big deal that there is a, a sound basis uh, for this, uh, for these models. Yeah, I, I picked uh, answer, uh, answering the right question as, as my answer. So it's nice to see that there is other people on the call who also feel like that is important. If not, the, the top one still still important. Um, but for me, you know, we we could do anything. Um, as Richard was talking about earlier, the technology is there. Um, but, but perhaps in the energy industry, uh, we're a little bit slower uh, to adopt to uh, data and digitalization and digital twins compared to other industries. Um, but the, the the opportunity is there to do that. Um, but we could we could spend a lot of time doing that and not actually achieve anything if we're not working to answer the right question. So um, for me, that's really crucial to really get the what is the what is the need, what is the requirement, what are we trying to do. Uh, what we're trying to answer. Oh, so you're um, saving energy yourself there. I am, yeah. yeah that, it's, uh, I, it's, it's key, isn't it? And then do you think? 
um so yeah answering the right question um uh i think we need to focus on that on on the work that we do pick the pick the right projects the projects that are really going to have impact I, I was slightly expecting this when i saw those questions but uh the only one with zero percent is realism of the visualizations um, and i'm slightly reassured that you know it's good to see how this impacts so you can communicate this to I think we've seen this in, in the built environment with 3D models. You know, it's great to communicate to people who might not be able to understand technical, you know, whether it's graphs or or documents or specifications or whatever, to be able to visualize it. But it, it doesn't necessarily need to be real, does it? Yeah, I, I probably agree with this, even though I'm a little bit biased in, in, in that regard to, to a degree, but even I didn't pick it, <laughs> right? Because I think from yeah, my perspective, the, the, the taking people on board for the journey, which will be something that's not on the list, but it, it probably factors in at least three of those, which is you know finding ways to communicate the results to a wider public, creating trust in the inputs by bringing more people on board so that it doesn't turn into just an you know academic you know discussion, um, and answering the right question are all com com you know components of it, um, in my view. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's it's really fascinating to see this work, and I, I really, I think we everybody here on this call really appreciates the the kind of incisive questions um, that have been asked. Um, so uh, thank you to the panelists. Uh, I'm reaching the end of the panel part, and I'm going to uh, hand back to Eloise. So, Eloise, what what's next? Thanks, Henry, uh, and thank you for chairing that discussion so well. Some really interesting questions um, and insights from the team. Uh, thank you to everyone. So, um, Richard uh, mentioned before, we're currently working on uh, developing a number of different themes around digitalisation in the energy system, including better understanding the part that digital twins will play in delivering that zero. So, um, a, a general invite, really, to anyone in the audience today, if you'd like to get involved, please reach out to any of the panellists here today. We'd be really interested um, to hear from you. Um, uh, yeah, and, and we'll, we'll just have to see, see what happens. So um, thank you. Uh, that's the end of the event. Uh, thank you all for coming along today and participating, either by asking a question or by submitting your opinion by the poll. It's really great to, uh, to, to uh, have that interaction today. Um, the recording uh, of this uh, event will be available um, on our website. Um, if you've registered, which you will have had to to get the link to join today, and then uh, Tabitha will be emailing that out uh, once, uh, once it's ready. And um, so please uh, look out for it in your inbox.